so um yeah so so thanks very much to the organizers for for organizing this, organizing this workshop I'm, I'm very sorry i can't be there in person um be great to to see and chat you all particularly because possibly one or two things i say might be be slightly controversial um if you do have any complaints that aren't adequately resolved with questions at the end of the talk then then i encourage you to to talk to my uh, esteemed collaborator Raphael Biso, um, if he, you know, disagrees with something I said, or, or you know, denies denies having agreed to be an author on the paper, or, or ever having met me in his life, then then you know we'll cross that bridge when we come to it. Um, but yeah, so the paper is called Islands Outside the Far Outside the Horizon. Um, came out on archive last week. Uh, so let's just dive right in with um, amps, which everyone has heard a lot about over the last decade or so, so I'll just say it very briefly. Um, AMPS argued that there's a paradox in, in a black hole uh, that's evaporating. If you assume unitarity, then this late time Hawking quantum up here has to be purified by the early Hawking modes, uh, but it also in semi-classical gravity is purified by the interior mode. And the key point is that one single observer, if they're computationally unbounded, uh, can sort of collect up all this radiation distill out of it a purification of this mode and then jump in with that and thereby uh, get a sort of impossible quantum state in a local lab. So something has gone wrong here. Something needs to be broken. This violates uh, monogamy of entanglement. Um, and AMPS's resolution to this paradox that they wanted to propose was pretty simple. It had two parts. The first was that outside the so-called stretched horizon of the black hole, Planck length outside the horizon, then you just had ordinary effective field theory, nothing weird, no, no black hole complementarity or anything like that. Um, but then the black hole interior that had this second purification of the, the late time Hawking mode just doesn't exist. Instead, space time ends on, on some sort of firewall uh, at the stretch horizon or around the stretch horizon. Um, so a sort of key feature of why they, they sort of found this, this argument satisfying is that if something crosses the stretch horizon, it's essentially impossible for it ever to cross back. Formally, it's still time like separated from future, but to get back out, you'd have to have a trans Planckian acceleration. Um, so there's no way an observer could actually do that in practice. So the point of view of from the point of view of someone remaining outside the black hole, you just have ordinary effective field theory, nothing weird happens. Just the infalling observer who who experiences something different or, or you know, they just die when they, they hit the firewall, so they don't experience much, but they don't experience the interior. So I think, you know, a lot of people read the AMS paper and, and proposed different resolutions to the problem. Uh, first few years, it felt like there were, you know, everyone had their own resolution, about a million different ones out there. A lot of those have gradually converged since. A lot of related ideas like ER equals EPR, state dependence, uh, and so on, into a sort of consistent alternative, which is some kind of more radical version of black hole complementarity than, than people believed in before AMPS, um, where just in principle, someone can, by, by doing some complicated manipulations of this early radiation, you can just change what you will see in terms of the, the interior of the park to, partner of the the interior partner of the Hawking mode okay so this is in this sort of picture then um the basic semi-classical causal structure of space-time is only protected by the complexity of of doing something that would be non-local uh, it's not a sort of fundamental feature of the universe so Ever since AMPS came out, it's probably the most controversial paper in physics of, of at least a long time, maybe 21st century or something. I don't know, you can make the case for it. There have been endless arguments uh, about all sorts of issues involved, like could anyone actually do implement the AMPS thought experiment in practice? Uh, probably not, at least in a causal way. That was that was Harlow and Hayden's answer, which I think is right. Um, so is a firewall in that case actually necessary? Can can this sort of souped up version of black hole complementarity make sense or is it hopelessly ambiguous? Uh, could the firewall that they proposed actually be formed? Is there some physical mechanism for, for how it should, would show up? How do we explain how it gets there in the first place? In fact, pretty much the one thing, as far as I know, nobody has ever complained about is that if 
you somehow get a firewall at the stretch horizon, you have no interior, then you're sort of all good on the information problem front. The black hole at that point is just an ordinary quantum object. Uh, nothing too weird happens. Just have ordinary unitarity and, and everything's great. So if you have this magical quantum object, then, then you don't need anything further. So the punchline of this talk is pretty simple. So that's wrong. Um, a firewall of the stretch horizon would not be enough. Uh, you would still need, essentially, black hole complementarity outside that firewall. Uh, the only thing that, that can save you in that way is a firewall much further outside the stretch horizon that can be probed by an observer at infinity. So that's giving up significantly more than, than AMPs were willing to give up. Okay. So that's setting out what the punchline is going to be, but let me let me just sort of give a slightly bigger picture summary of what I'm going to say. Um, the basic idea is going to be that we're going to show that information that semi-classically is far outside the stretch horizon uh, is actually contained in an island. Okay, so hopefully everyone is familiar with the concept of islands from the last few years. Uh, but it's an island associated to, to essentially Hawking radiation, Hawking radiation that's even further outside the horizon, and we'd expect to be able to be treated by, by sort of ordinary effective field theory. This radiation actually has large angular momentum. It's not sort of true Hawking radiation that will naturally escape off to infinity. So sort of naturally, with very high probability, it will be reflected back into the black hole. It will get an order, uh, the Schwarzschild radius, distance out or less, um, very much less in many cases, depending on the angular momentum, and then it will get reflected back in and, and fall into the black hole. Nevertheless, if you're willing to, to put in a load of effort, there are ways that you can get that radiation out to infinity just within effective field theory. So this is comes under the broad heading of what's called black hole mining. And in particular, that process can happen entirely space-like from the island, and so it should happen without changing anything in the island itself. And so we're going to argue that that means that this, this radiation should be taken just as seriously, its island should be taken just as seriously as any, any other radiation. Um, and hence, you can you can use it to, to the radiation to decode the island, at least if you extract it to infinity. So if you make your choice of R optimally, then the island can, in fact, protrude from the, the horizon by proper distance that's proportional to the, the square root of the Planck length times the horizon radius of the black hole. So if the horizon radius of the black hole gets very big, then this sort of becomes parametrically large in, in Planck units, less than the size of the black hole, but still big. In particular, for a supermassive black hole, if you plug this in, it's something of the order of the, the Bohr radius in an atom. OK, so it's an atomic scale thing. It's still comparatively microscopic compared to us, but it's, it's very, very large compared to the Planck scale. The fact that this island exists is going to imply some sort of breakdown of what we'll call semi-classical gravity effective field theory. Um, so that breakdown could be a far wall, potentially. Uh, it could be black hole complementarity, or non-isometric codes, a sort of a sort of rejigging of the, the degrees of freedom between effective field theory and the fundamental degrees of freedom. Um, but it's happening at this location that is is far, far outside the horizon, and hence it can be in principle be probed by an asymptotic observer. Okay, so that's that's the basic summary. Um, let's just go through it in a bit more detail what this all means. I apologize, I'm very lazy making my talk and there's random text that shouldn't be there yet. Um, okay, so normally standard standard uh, definitions of, of an island, uh, our starting point is some external quantum system that is not uh, in the gravitational space-time at all. Well, at the very least, it, it will be modes at some sort of asymptotic infinity where they're sort of de defined in, in a state-independent way. So that's the, the conventional setup. Um, as I said on the previous slide, um, we're not going to be doing that. Uh, however, um, even if you start with modes that are not remotely at infinity at all, they're deep within the gravitating space-time, then if you have some, some unitary process that will extract all of them to infinity, so you can apply some unitary to your space-time that, that takes them all out, puts them in an external system, uh, then after you've done that, you will have an island associated with the external system. And the island that you get will be independent of the process that you used. It's not defined by this process. It's just defined by the, the entanglement structure. 
Um, and so it's very natural to, to associate the island uh, to those modes even before they get extracted. In some sense, the information has to already be encoded in them because any time anything that takes them out will will also also collect the the information in this island. Okay, so in practice, how do you find um, the island associated some some explicit set of modes? Well, you just use the usual formula that, that people are probably pretty familiar with of you define a generalized entropy for uh, those modes together with an island that is given by the area of the edge of the island plus the bulk entropy of your fixed set of modes plus everything inside the island. And then you extremize that quantity in the usual way and take the, the smallest extremal surface if necessary. So we're going to study uh, the island associated to some, some you know, bulk effective theory, quantum field theory modes uh, with an explicit cutoff on the modes that I'm going to call epsilon r. And we're going to take all the modes below that cutoff that are a proper distance away from the black hole horizon, rho greater than, than some particular parameter rho r. OK, and we're going to do this after the page time. So we're going to have a load of early time radiation all the way out here. Um, that's basically inevitably going to mean we're, we're definitely going to get an island just by, by simple maximum arguments. You, you can see that this obviously has to be true. Um, so the question is, where is that island? What in particular is sort of the, the, how far is it outside or inside the horizon? So, um, yeah, I maybe, I maybe should have, I forgot to include this in text. There's an important point here, which is that back when islands were first being discovered in 2019, everyone sort of assumed they would always be inside a black hole horizon. Then there was a very nice paper by Almiri, uh, uh, Maldacena and Mahajan, other way around, I, I can't get my alphabetical order out, Mahajan and Maldacena, um, where they showed that if you have a black hole with thermal equilibrium with a bath, then the island can actually be outside the horizon. So the important point here is that by including these modes that are very close to the horizon that have large angular momentum, those modes are naturally getting reflected back into the black hole. And so they're in thermal equilibrium with the black hole. The ingoing modes are in a thermal state that's in equilibrium with the black hole. And that's exactly the setting where we can potentially expect to see an island outside the horizon. OK. So let's just see, see what actually happens. Um, what we're going to see is that it's going to be not just outside the horizon, but it's actually going to be far outside. Uh, so the key point is that um, when we look at the, the entanglement structure of S bulk, okay, we have a load of modes involved. Uh, in particular, there's both modes of the S wave sector and, and order one, more generally, order one angular momentum modes, some small number of them, but then there's also some very large number of modes with very large angular momentum. Uh, and those are going to contribute to the entanglement between R and I, because R and I are going to be pretty close together. R, rho R is going to be very small compared to the radius of the black hole. Um, and all those modes with large angular momentum are going to be locally in the hard or Hawking state. OK, so ignoring some small number of modes whose effects we can, we can compute in a controlled way and, and check that they don't matter, then we can just treat this black hole as, as being in a hard or Hawking state, even though it's actually evaporating. Nice thing about the hard or Hawking state is it has an awful lot of symmetry. And in fact, in particular, it has a, a time reflection symmetry and it has rotational symmetry. Those two things together tell us that the island QES is necessarily some constant radius sphere uh, in the same sort of t equals zero Schwarzschild slice as the edge of, edge of my region R. Okay. So the only thing we have to do to work out where this island is, is solve a single equation, which is the generalized entropy of R together with the island should be uh, invariant at first order under variations of the distance rho i of the island outside the horizon. OK, so let's do that. Simple enough. Firstly, we have the area term, how the, the gradient of the area is a function of rho i. This is just linearly proportional to rho i times, uh, you got to make the dimensions right. So you do that by, by inserting an appropriate factor of the horizon radius of the black hole. 
And there's then there's some order one prefactor that just comes down to some properties of the surface areas of spheres and D dimensions. Okay, so that's that's really very simple. Uh, the more interesting term is the, the bulk entropy. So the bulk entropy here of modes in R below an explicit cutoff together with modes in I contains is uh, the, the global state is pure. So the entropy of R union I is equal to the entropy of this little strip between row I and row R that over here I've called B. Okay, so that's simple as computer. It doesn't involve any complicated gray body factors or anything like that. It's just some very narrow slab near the black hole horizon. The entropy entanglement entropy of a slab in D dimensions uh, is a known formula in quantum field theory. Okay, this is where it's key that we're in the harder Hawking state, so the state is not singular at the horizon. So we can use, use standard Minkowski space formula. Has three terms, essentially. Uh, the first term is the UV divergent term from very short range entanglement oops, near the edge of the island I. Okay, so this diverges proportional to some cutoff epsilon I to the D minus two times the, the surface area of that edge of the slab. Uh, this term is renormalized into to Newton's constant. It's sort of absorbed into the area term over here. So this term we, we can ignore after renormalizing. The second term is the same thing, but at the other side over at row R. Okay, this is not absorbed into an area term. This is the, the cutoff here, epsilon R, is an explicit cutoff on the modes that we're, we're including in R. So this is just some finite but large thing. Okay, in particular, this thing doesn't depend on the position row I of the island, so it doesn't matter at all to, to our computation of where that island is. So the term that actually matters is this third one, that is again proportional to the cross-sectional area times the uh, sort of width of the slab to the d minus two, times some order one constant kappa that depends on the, the specifics of the theory. Um, it's known for sort of th th numerically for free theories. It's known uh, analytically for holographic theories and so on. This is, you know, the, the constant depends on the theory, but the form is universal. So then we can just take the derivative of this term with respect to row i, it gives me a thing. Coming from this term here, I have the area term divided by 4g, and then I just solve for the location of the island and I get some formula, and it's given by, by this formula here. Okay, um, uh, has a factor of g, which is wanting to make it small uh, in the semi-classical limit, but it also has a one over rho r to the d minus one. And this just comes from the fact that the, the bulk entropy gradient gets much bigger the closer rho r is to the horizon. Okay, so this formula I derived sort of assumes that rho r is much bigger than rho i. Um, and we definitely, for this to make any sense, for the, to have an island sort of independent of, of r, then we'd better at least have rho r bigger than rho i. Um, so this is sort of a self-consistency condition on this, this island formula, this island existing or making sense at all. Um, and if you just plug in, you know, you sort of get this bound being as close to saturated as possible, uh, plugging in this formula, then you find that we can make rho r, the sort of smallest possible rho r, which gives a sensible answer, and the largest possible uh, rho i that, that makes sense, both scale, as the Planck length to the d minus two over d times the horizon radius to the two over d. In particular, if we're in uh, four space-time dimensions, which we we are, uh, then this is the square root of L Planck times the, uh, the radius of the horizon, which is is exactly um, uh, exactly the the formula I said a couple of slides ago. Okay, so this is you know this is like the one calculation uh, I'm going to do in this talk, um, but yeah. Uh, the key point is that this is this is much larger than the Planck scale. Even though, if uh, rho r was equal or, or scaled with our horizon, it would have been much smaller than the the Planck scale. It's sort of non-trivial that the rho r dependence here is big enough. So this is L Planck squared. So we're initially in L Planck squared over our horizon distance away from the horizon. If if rho r is order the horizon ra radius. But there's sufficiently strong scaling with rho r here um, that if we make rho r as small as possible, it gets much bigger uh, than a Planck distance away from the horizon. It's far outside the stretched horizon. Okay. 
So um, I want to emphasize that even though we, we sort of used the island rule to compute this formula, used which in turn comes from, from replicatric gravitational particles, replicable wormholes, and so on, uh, then even if you didn't know about them, you could have you could have basically worked out the same result up to the, the detailed uh, sort of order one coefficients in row i uh, just by looking at thinking about the hayden Preskill decoding criteria. Um, so the idea here is that normally in hayden Preskill, we would say that some Hawking mode coming out here would encode an infalling mode that fell into the black hole. Uh, or if this, together with the early radiation, would encode it, um, so long as this infalling mode was at least a scrambling time uh, behind before the outgoing mode escaped the black hole. Um, but now we're working with some region that itself is very close to the horizon, and there's a couple of effects that, that sort of change that uh, somewhat. The first is that if you have a large number of modes that are being emitted at a given time, which we do because we have a large number of angular momentum modes, um, then that decreases the scrambling time. This was an effect, I think, originally found in, in both the first papers on islands, um, but it can be explained intuitively just from the, the dynamics of fast scrambling. Basically, if you collect a load of modes at once, you don't need the information to have been fully scrambled up because you're, you're, it just needs to have scra got scrambled enough to have got into like morally one of the modes you collected. If you collected some really large number of modes, then, then even if it hasn't completely scrambled, you can already, already see the effect. And the second thing is an even simpler effect that um, an outgoing mode that sort of escapes from the black hole a scrambling time after this, this mode fell in will have already reached R long before that, right? Because R itself is, is very close to the black hole. And, and so um, it doesn't need to, you don't need to wait as long for it to come out. So if you combine these two effects, and also note that because there's an approximate time reflection symmetry for the large angular momentum modes, then we must also have that a mode coming out at uh, the same time in the future is encoded in R just by, by symmetry. Um, then that tells you which modes going in have to make it into the island and which modes going out have to make it in the island. And that together fixes the location of the island up to up to the detailed uh, order one coefficient. Okay, so this really is just a correct result that we should expect independently from unitarity of black hole evaporation. It's not uh, the island calculations are making it more precise, but they're not they're not fundamentally needed to expect in the first place. Okay, so that's uh, why we have the island at all. Um, the second thing that you need to worry about is whether you can uh, actually extract all the radiation R, as I, I claimed in the first place. Because if you can't do that, then it's not clear that it makes sense to talk about its island at all. Um, and in particular, uh, for, our, for this sort of picture to make sense and not be totally paradoxical, uh, we need to both be able to extract all the modes in R to infinity at the same time. So we can talk about that island, but we also need uh, to then not be able to extract the island to infinity as well, um, because that would allow all sorts of paradoxes, right? We would have some sort of cloning paradox where we extracted radiation that encoded the island to infinity, and at the same time had the island come out to the infinity, and, and so collect that as well. And so we sort of need to be able to collect, extract the modes in, in the maximum R allowable, but no more. We shouldn't be able to collect larger angular momentum modes at the same time. Okay, so as I said at the beginning, there's ways to mine a lot of lot of uh, large angular momentum modes from near the black hole horizon. The easiest way, in fact, to do it as sort of somebody actually inside the space time, is basically to get a load of strings. They need to be uh, null energy condition saturating strings, so like the fundamental strings in string theory. Uh, or other string, any other strings that have the same same sort of strength to weight ratio. Otherwise, you're never going to be able to. Uh, uh, they're not going to be able to carry their own weight. But if they if they do saturate the non energy condition, then you you can put these things very close to the horizon. We just take a load of them and we thread the near horizon region with them. Okay, and the effect of this is that the bottom of the string is very hot. It absorbs quantum of Hawking radiation. 
And those quantum radiation, Hawking radiation just flow directly up the string. And there's no issues with, with getting reflected in because of large angular momentum, because they're just sort of localized on the string. They get wicked up the string to infinity. And this lets you extract a large number of modes at the same time, subject to a couple of constraints. Um, so there's a very nice paper that actually came out the same day as AMPS back in 2012 by Adam Brown, uh, where he sort of tried to work out not just by this method, but actually any method of mining black hole, how many modes you can collect. Uh, and with this particular method, which which is one optimal way of doing it, there are two constraints. The first is if you have too many strings and the strings are too heavy, then you're going to create a large back reaction on the black hole. So you need to avoid doing that. And the second thing is that when this string absorbs a quantity of Hawking radiation, it needs to be able to sort of... Uh, not break because of the extra energy. This is this is sometimes described as the string melting because it absorbs some radiation, gets hot, and breaks into pieces. Uh, so, so for A, you need the string to not be too heavy, i.e. to have a low enough tension. Uh, but for B, you need it to have a high enough tension that it, it doesn't melt. Uh, it can take the weight of the Hawking quanta. If you combine these things together, then you find that for an optimal uh, tension string, then you can exactly uh, you can extract any set of modes R that obey the bound we found for having a sensible island, but not anymore. So that's exactly the sort of thing we, we want to deceive, to have this story be consistent, uh, that all the modes in R can be extracted, but you, you can't do anything paradoxical. Okay, great. Um, of course, you might say, how do we know that we even have knowledge conditions saturating strings in the first place? In particular, even if we, we believe in string theory, then in string theory, you only have fundamental strings with one particular tension. You can't, you can't dial a tension and pick, pick the strings with the perfect tension you want. Um, so we'd like to have a way of doing this without worrying about using strings. Um, and fortunately, uh, there is a way to do that, at least if you just forget about some observer in the space time trying to actually extract all these modes for their own purposes and just talk more abstractly about is there an operator in effective field theory that will extract these modes to infinity? So you allow, for example, sort of out of time ordered operators uh, very far from the black hole. So in quantum field theory, there's a theorem, a very nice theorem called the time like tube theorem that says any operator localized in this region R can be arbitrarily well approximated by an operator at some tube in the green region here at asymptotic uh, past and future infinity in this case. Okay, so in free QFTs, this, this, these operators can be pretty explicitly reconstructed uh, just by looking at the evolution of, of creation annihilation operators for the relevant modes. Um, and we discussed that in detail in the paper and, and what this operator actually looks like. But there's some operator that so, so we can define an operator in R that sort of extracts all the modes into, we want into an external quantum system. And then if we ignore back reaction and just think about quantum field theory, then there will also be an operator at infinity that will do the same thing. It'll be an out of time ordered operator, but it will, will be an operator localized in that region. Of course, if you're working instead in semi-classical gravity, then you have to worry about whether this operator is itself going to create back reaction that's that's going to make it not work in the way it did in quantum field theory. You can uh, estimate what that back reaction will be and whether it will be a problem. And you find yet again uh, that exactly the same bound shows up, that back reaction becomes big, the operator that's supposed to re extract everything in R no longer works, exactly when R becomes comparable, row R becomes comparable in size to row I. Okay, so as long as you've got a pretty big gap between the two, say a factor of a million or something, doesn't have to be parametrically large, uh, then the back reaction is very controlled and everything seems fine. It's also worth noting that uh, even when rho r is much bigger than rho i, um, then there will be a little bit of back reaction. The little bit of back reaction will not change anything at the relevant scales for modes in R. Right, the cutoff in, in our epsilon r is we can make comparable in size to rho r. And so, so all the modes have pretty long wavelength. They don't care about tiny back, re back reaction. But it will always be enough to hide this island 
uh, completely behind the horizon. So basically that just follows from the quantum focusing conjecture, but you can also just explicitly compute it. And this is again, the same thing that, that uh, AMM found uh, when they considered just uh, 2D islands outside the horizon, like sort of close to the stretch horizon. Um, that if you decouple the system and, and stop these modes falling into the black hole, then the island won't be outside the horizon anymore. It will get hidden behind the horizon. Okay, great. So the island's far outside the horizon. We can do something to extract those modes to infinity. Uh, if we do so, that will hide the island behind the horizon, so we can't get the island out at the same time. Um, but if we don't do anything, the, the island is just outside the horizon. The next step I want to argue is just that um, this means if you want firewalls to work in the way that AMPS intended, so you just have ordinary effective field theory and firewalls and that's it, then the firewalls have to be far outside the horizon as well. So to argue this, let's just assume that there is some uh, proper distance, rho EFT, maybe it's of order the Planck length, um, that is smaller than rho i, the distance the island outside the horizon, and semi-classical gravity is valid outside this distance. Okay, so in, in sort of a firewall picture, then this is this is the radius where the firewall is sitting, maybe. Uh, in black hole complementarity, it would be it would be the point where complementarity comes into play. Um, whatever it is, it's some scale where where ordinary EFT breaks down. Okay. So before we do any extraction or anything like that. We have some modes in R, and we also have some information sitting on the island. They're space-like separated degrees of freedom in uh, ordinary effective field theory. And so the no cloning theorem tells us that sort of I can't be encoded in R. Uh, say, for example, if we have a purification of the thing in I in an external system, that can't also be purified uh, by R. Okay. We then do some extraction. So we, we maybe apply this time like tubes theorem operator, null infinity here. And that extraction process occurs entirely in some, some region where effective field theory is valid. And it occurs entirely space like separated from the island and space like separated from the firewall if the firewall exists. Okay. So that means it has to commute with the state of the island. And after extraction, the island still, information in the island still just has to be there. It still can't be encoded in R, okay? Because it, it you know, wasn't encoded in R in the first place, and then we just did some effective field theory operator acting on R, it still can't be encoded in it. But once we've extracted all this stuff into an external quantum system, we can do replicatory computations of, say, the PETS map, and they say that we can learn what was in the island from, from some complicated operator acting on R. So at that point, we have a contradiction with our original assumption. Uh, so we could conclude that the semi-classical gravity effective field theory has to break down at least out far, as far outside the black hole as the island. So just very briefly, it's worth mentioning that, um, in fact, you don't even need the island to be that far, far outside the stretch horizon to, to get this argument to work, to make it as strong as possible than it should be. Um, but even if we just take rho r to sort of be some order one but small constant epsilon times the horizon radius of the black hole, um, so g independent but small constant epsilon, let's say, uh, then that's already enough to argue that the firewall has to be far outside the stretch horizon if one exists. Uh, so the argument is very simple. Um, so, ooh. Okay, so if we just plug in the formula we had for the island from before, we row R given by this formula, then we get that the island is a proper distance outside the horizon that's sort of like L Planck squared over R horizon. This is some tiny, tiny number, uh, but times epsilon to the minus three. So it's a, a you know, relatively big, but G independent constant times the Planck distance squared divided by the radius of black hole. So this is far, well inside the stretch horizon. It's much smaller than the, the Planck distance. Um, but an ingoing mode that fell into the black hole a little less than a scrambling time ago and eventually makes it into the island will already be space-like separated from the radiation in R well before 
it reaches the stretch horizon. Okay, so this means we can look at some Cauchy slice here, shown in light blue that sort of goes into the past, uh, in which this ingoing mode and the radiation are already space-like, but we also know because this ingoing mode eventually makes it into the island, then it's supposed to be encoded in R, at least once we extract it, and we have exactly the same paradox we had before. Okay, so this is just even if you're a bit dubious about the, the back reaction issues and so on, which you shouldn't be, they're fine, they're under control, um, then you've still got pretty much the same problem. Okay, so we're almost done. Uh, let me just make final argument, which is that uh, if we have some observer far from the black hole, they can verify that this, this breakdown has happened or at least see what form it's taken. Okay, so the first thing to note is that if we're in, in a little rocket hovering near the, the edge of the horizon, then the proper acceleration required to, to hover there is very, very small. It's much smaller than, than Planckian. It's in fact one over uh, square root of Planck. Uh, sorry, the units of acceleration are one over, yeah, it's one over the square root of L Planck times the horizon radius. Uh, so some some small thing. Um, so locally, someone in a little rocket can easily dip into the island then come back out again, and yeah, just dip below the island radius, come back out outside the island radius and so on. Uh, this is very, very different from what happens at the stretched horizon where once you go in, there's no way to get back out again. But we'd like to do better than that. We'd like to show that if you start off near infinity, then you can do some relatively simple probe uh, that can send something into the island, ideally you yourself, but if not, then at least some, some probe system, and then get a signal back out, uh, back out to infinity again, so you don't have to, to commit suicide in order to tell whether a firewall is there. You'd be able to, to share it with your friends afterwards, um, and in something like ADS-CFT, then, then you... Uh, you know, can um, can detect it using the extrapolate dictionary in the CFT. So if we allow out of time order operators, um, which we can in ADS CFT, we can, we can just plug it in. Um, then this is sort of easy to do. We it's just a time like cube theorem again. Um, but we'd like to do better and and say, what if we're just inside the space time? Can we can we just do it ourselves? Right? If we went to a supermassive black hole uh, and somehow got it after the page time. I guess wait for 10 to the 30, 40 years, whatever, whatever it might be. Um, then can we just sort of fly in and fly back out again? The easiest way to do that, in fact, is to, to just use a, another nice knowledge condition saturating string. In that case, you just have one of those strings, you clip onto the end of it, and you you slowly get lowered down and then slowly get pulled back up again. Okay, there's there's some subtleties there where maybe you want two strings at the angle, so you, at an angle, so you can vary the tension. But it's easy to do. You can just be lowered down and then pulled back up. Um, if you don't have that, uh, then it's a bit harder. Um, in particular, the sort of most naive thing to do is just fly in on a rocket while accelerating outwards, and then try to slow down and go back out. Um, the trouble is that if you do that, the back reaction from the rocket exhaust will tend to hide the island. Okay. Um, so you have to be a bit careful. Uh, the other, another obvious option is you just free fall in and then try to send a signal back out, um, using a laser or something. Again, the problem is if, if you really free fall from infinity, then you have so much time dilation by the time you're in the near horizon region that you only experience around a Planck time after entering the island. Um, so the nicest construction we had found for, for dealing with this is to actually imagine that the black hole is is charged. It doesn't have to be near extreme or anything, but it has has some some sort of order one. It's charge to mass ratio is, is order one, if relatively small, maybe. Um, and then uh, shoot a spaceship with the same charge towards the black hole. Um, so because gravity is very weak, uh, then you can easily make the charge to mass ratio of the, the spaceship very large. And that means you can uh, fire it in very fast, but then have it be repulsed by the black hole and just come to a stop really pretty close to the, the black hole horizon, like in deep in the near horizon region. Then all you do is you just uh, collect all the charge in the spaceship in, in some escape pod or whatever, release that escape pod. That escape pod gets fired back out to infinity really, really fast. And the crucial thing is it takes all the, 
the initial energy of, of the spaceship away away with it. And you, you did all that. You end up with some neutral spaceship sitting in the near horizon region at rest without having anything, any energy go into the black hole uh, horizon. OK, so this avoids the back reaction issue you have with the rocket. Then they can just free fall uh, until they reach the island. After reaching the island, they have plenty of time to uh, there's not as much time dilation because they started near the black hole. They have plenty of time to just send a signal back out to infinity. Maybe they quantum teleport themselves back out in that signal. Uh, and um, yeah, then they've they've directly probed what's in the island. They can just see whether there's a firewall or, or black hole complementarity. OK, great. So that's that's basically what I have. Uh, just yeah, here are some conclusions. Just to, to reiterate the points. Um, so, yeah, the, the near horizon modes can have an island that extends as far as the square root of the horizon radius and Planck units out from the horizon. Uh, so sort of traditional semi-classical gravity effective field theory, meaning not anything involving black hole com complementarity, non-isometric codes, ER equals EPR, uh, must break down at this distance. The obvious options some version of black hole complementarity or a firewall. Um, and in that case, the two can be distinguished from asymptotic infinity. In particular, something I didn't talk about in detail is that some people have speculated that recently that maybe um, smooth geometry at the horizon emerges from uh, averaging over some ensemble of boundary theories where each individual theory in the ensemble has a firewall. That just doesn't work. Um, if If... You know, if the probes in each of the individual theories just hit a firewall and get vaporized, then averaging over those theories, it will still get vaporized. Um, yeah. So, cool. That's all I have to say. Any questions? Uh, please go ahead. Great. Thanks, Jeff. All right. I, I think we only have time for one or two questions. Maybe Juan. Did you think? You said there was a minimum rho r, right? That is of the order that you have there in the slide. If you make it yep. slightly smaller, then if I understand there is no solution to the island equation. Yep. Now, if you say that in that case, perhaps uh, the two merge together, or what, what is the statement of what happens in that case? Yeah, no, so... Um... So, okay, the, the formula I used is only valid when epsilon r is much smaller than the, the gap between the two. Um, so, yeah, so, so I think the right statement is that even when you're getting to that minimum rho r, then you're already smaller than you can actually get to. Uh, then, then it actually makes sense to talk about. Like these, the, the extraction processes require sort of you know, some relatively large factor larger than that. I think as you try to make rho r closer and closer to that, then you'll be able to extract it, but your the cutoff on the modes that you can extract will start getting smaller uh, or longer, you know, lower energies, longer wavelengths. Um, and then the the formula for where where the island is will start getting worse and be getting corrected from, from finite cutoff effects. Uh, that will depend on the details of like exactly which modes you're extracting, and yeah, I so I think it just like the time when the solution disappears is already up to the point where where it stops making sense to talk about it. It's not long after, but it is after it. Right. Is that clear? Other questions? Since we're still setting up the next talk, maybe you can hear me, Jeff. Yep. Yeah. So can I ask? So if I, I, I think almost everything you said, I could also say if I just look at a Rindler horizon in ADS and then I just make the boundary region a little bit bigger, I could call that mining. And I think everything that you said would have an avatar in that. Um, but then where's the violation of? semi-classical gravitational effective field theory. It seems like it's just the usual idea that you can take operators in the bulk and represent them in the boundary. Um, sorry, I, I, I would need to understand the setup. I'm, I'm not quite sure why you made the boundary region a little bit bigger. 
That, that's the mining. It's like you, 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 you took the radiation that you had before, and then you just extracted a bit more of the system. So you made your boundary region bigger. So now you can access more things. Um, yeah, ju that just seems quite different to me. Um, like, yeah, maybe we need to talk about this offline because it, it's not obvious to me how, how exactly how you think the analogy works. So you're, you're literally just talking about as you enlarge the boundary region, then the, the entanglement wedge gets bigger. Um, yes. yeah, I, I like, okay. The, the differences are that's like a CFT boundary versus some effective field theory modes in the bulk that you're adding. Um, like I would tend to say that's like not that different and I'm pretty comfortable with just, you know, islands coming from black hole complementarity, but like a lot of people aren't. That's why, why there's, right. So there's, okay, here's another way to say it in, in a language that will work for you. Uh, like there's no non-isometric encoding going on when you make the thing a bit bigger there. Like, I think in the language you will like, what this is showing is that there's non-isometricness happening uh, in a black hole, even quite a long way outside the horizon. And that's, yeah. I think, just not a feature that is showing up in ads Rindler unless you're at least doing something pretty weird. Um, yeah. Would, would you agree with that? Uh, I just, another way of asking the question is I didn't see where the page time came into your argument. Are you oh, sorry. Yeah. So, so I assumed at the very beginning it was all after the page time. If it wasn't after the page time, then the the empty QES will have smaller generalized entropy than the island one. Um, and so, yeah. So the page time just comes in for there's a there's an overall constant to the entropy um, of the empty QES that just comes from the large number of Hawking modes like really far away at infinity. Uh, that will linearly increase with time, and that's got to be big enough that this island QES dominates instead. Um, it doesn't have an effect on the island QES computation itself for where it is, but it affects whether it's dominant or not. All right, thanks. I think we should go on. So, Jeff, can you stop sharing your screen, please? Yep.